In our last couple of videos, we've been looking at the utilities of Port Huron, uh, basically the gas company and the electric company. And I told you in the last video that competition came from two different sources for the gas company. Of course, it was the Excelsior Electric Company uh, that we looked at in our last video. But we never got around to discussing the second one. And that was the first natural gas company in Port Huron, the St. Clair Light and Fuel Company. For approximately 16 years from the time of its organization, the Port Huron Gas Light Company had a monopoly on the gas business in Port Huron. But in 1886, the activities of one Charles A. Bailey in his search for oil culminated in the formation of a natural gas company. Charles Bailey, living on his farm just west of 24th Street, that would have been right opposite uh, Memorial Stadium now. He had interested himself the year before in reports of the existence of producing oil wells in the vicinity of Petrolia, Canada, and that the operators had followed the oil formation into Sarnia with success. Well, here, Bailey found that the oil formation crossed his property on 24th Street and appealed to a number of Port Huron citizens who contributed $500 to drill a test well. Johnson Brothers of Petrolia were awarded the contract to sink the well. And at a depth of 515 feet, they struck not only oil, but gas with a locked-in pressure of 250 pounds and a flow of 9 million cubic feet per 24 hours. Well, to make a long story short, gas fever and oil fever hit the city of Port Chern and Fort Gratiot. The investors were so excited they started buying property all over uh, those two localities. They started to lease this land to do away with any competition there might be. They offered $200 for each well that produced gas, and if oil were found, they would give the owner one-eighth of the product and do all the work. Well, meanwhile, the idea of finding gas on their own premises took fire with the townspeople, and the sporadic digging of wells started throughout the city. Among the hundreds who were stricken with the gas and oil fever were many of Port Huron leading citizens, including Henry Howard, uh, William Botsford of the Botsford Elevator Company, and uh, Henry McMoran, of course, he owned a lot of things in town. Henry Howard put down three wells, one at his residence on Military Street, one at his mill on the south side of Black River at his mouth, and one back at the First National Bank. Uh, this was actually on the southwest corner of uh, Huron Avenue and Quay. And for those of us at a certain age, this is where the Fox Jewelry Store used to be. The Upton Works, which was an agricultural implement, uh, factory in uh, what is now South Park, uh, at the time it was called Uptonville, found that as well as uh, not only produced enough gas to heat the and Bodsford found enough gas, he says a roaring vein as it was described, to run the boilers at his elevator, which also produced the power for the Electric Street Railway. Orchard and hum with the industry of well digging and the clack clatter of rocker beams intoned like a metronome and the pulse of that industry. Wells, uh, when drilled, would be torpedoed or shot with nitroglycerin, a roar would be heard, and then, as one eyewitness stated, there would be a beautiful flow of gas. Fires and explosions added extra excitement, with wells going wild and blowing flames and tools into the air from 40 to 200 feet above the derricks, causing great loss to parties involved, and in many instances, severe injury to both workmen and the well owners. Dorothy Mitz, in her book, The History of Gas Service in Port Huron, referred to Port Huron as a city of derricks, because there was derricks all over the place. I wish we could have a picture of that. By the middle of November, an 8-inch main had been laid from the Bailey Wells on 24th Street down Howard to 7th Street, north on 7th to Water Street, and east on Water to Military Street. Additional crews were added before the winter was over, Ten more mains, including one across Black River, were laid at an estimated cost of $7,000 per mile. When Water Street was first reached with the main, a torch some 10 to 15 feet high was burned in front of the Metz Carriage Manufacturing Shop on Water at 7th Street, directly north of the Loth Hotel. The flaming torch was a novel spectacle, which attracted people from all over the city, and as the mains progressed, additional torches burnt uncontrolled in different sections of the city. 
especially in the business sections on Huron Avenue and on Military Street, where gas fitters and plumbers took advantage of the crowds to demonstrate the natural gas burners. As the gas main progressed down Howard Street and burrowed its way through the city and across Black River, curious crowds gathered and idly watched the men at work. By the time the ditch started to eat its way up here in Avenue, these sidewalk superintendents had grown in larger numbers and among them were many store owners eagerly waiting to take advantage of the cheaper gas about to be supplied to them. Now keep in mind, there are now two different sets of gas mains going through the city. The first one, of course, was the artificial gas, and now they have the natural gas. And, of course, everybody's very eager to get that because it's going to be cheaper than the artificial gas. And as it went up here in Avenue on the east side between Butler, which is now Grand River, and Broad Street, which is now McMorrin, was the Union Hotel. If we look at the Union Hotel in previous videos, uh, it was located in a 300 block of uh, Huron Avenue on the east side, and this is what it looks like today. A big gap between the, the two taller buildings, of course, is where the hotel was at. But this hotel was uh, owned and managed by a fellow by the name of Charles Grebe. Mr. Grebe was as eager as all the others along the avenue to use natural gas, and as it happened, the gang of Pittsburgh workmen lay in the mains were staying at the Union Hotel. I always found it was a little bit unusual to find workmen all the way in Pittsburgh in order to lay these mains, but I guess uh, no one around here was qualified for it. About the middle of the last week in November, Mr. Grebe's eagerness prompted him to offer the men a week's board and room free if the main was far enough along so that he could tap the grass for his hotel by Saturday night. The town people soon heard of Grib's offer, and the crowds grew larger than ever to watch the workmen's progress. Peddlers and bakers had arrived in town, too, to mingle with the crowds. It is said that there were more confidence men in the city at this particular time than came with the summer circuses. As one witness stated, the men worked like beavers. But the dark of that Saturday night came, and found the main shy of the hotel by several yards. There was no natural gas for the Union's guests that night. Mr. Grebe was not obliged to feed and keep the men as he had offered. There was much sympathy in the town, however, for the men who had done their heroic best but had lost the wager. And among the sympathizers was a theatrical troupe, also guests at the hotel and headed by Roland Reed, a matinee idol at that time. The troop decided to entertain the men at the hotel that night after their performance at the city opera house as a sort of consolation prize. As it turned out, the party was quite an affair. What with uninvited guests slipping in and many toasts drunk, Roland Reed put on skits and sang hit tunes of his road show, The Humbug. And after that, a magician in the troop started to entertain the crowd with some sleight of hand tricks when one of the Pittsburgh gas boys got into a fight with one of the uninvited confidence men. Like in nothing better than a good fight, the contestants were hustled out of the hotel by the men and out on the cedar block pavement that was here in Avenue. The crowd made a circle around the fighters and the two pummeled one another for almost half an hour before the gas man finally knocked out the faker. It was a great fight, the best that had been seen since the days of the lumberjack fights on Old Butler Street. Treating the workers became the order of the day, and most of the store owners and other businessmen gave gifts of cigars and tobacco and other presents to the workmen as gas reached their establishments. And when the gas mains reached the Sandberg Brewery and the Kearns Brewery, barrels and cakes were rolled out and the workmen and watchers alike were given all the beer they could drink. There was a happy time and an exciting time in the old town that year. Of course, later on, the Sandberg Brewery would become the Port Chirin Brewery, and this was uh, on the corner of Michigan and Bard Street, which would be the present location as it looks today, or at least when Google took this picture. And of course, the Kern Brewery Company was over on River Street. I imagine those uh, merchants must have been pretty happy to be given away free beer to get that cheaper gas. This also made me realize that the gas was going to companies not only on the main drag of Huron Avenue, 
but also uh, off the main drag, which Michigan Street would certainly be. You heard me mention the uh, Cedar Street of Huron Avenue. Uh, I don't know if I ever uh, talked about this before in one of my videos. I know we talked about the plank roads and the brick roads, but Huron Avenue was also a, a cedar road as well. Most main roads started out as dirt roads, and then of course they, they had the planks, which was an improvement, especially from the mud. And then they came up with the cedar. Now the cedar was actually uh, before the paved, uh, the brick pavement, but it was also a plank road because underneath that cedar there was an underlayment of planks, as you can see from this illustration here. The St. Clair Light and Fuel Company was positive there was enough gas to supply the whole city and continued to put down wells as fast as they could be drilled. Port Huron Commercial Newspaper especially made much of all the improvements that were being made in Port Huron and the things that were being done to attract uh, new businesses and the advantages of living in Port Huron. Port Huron, it pointed out, was second only to New York as a port of entry with 100,000 immigrants arriving annually, seeking homes and labor. And due to its railroad facilities and water transportation, all markets in the universe were in direct communication with our city. Citing and considering all these things, the Port Huron Commercial Newspaper then affirmed that now, with an immense reservoir of natural gas held under the city, Port Huron was destined to be the busiest, liveliest, and largest city in the West. In the meantime, the Weekly Daily Times quietly noted that of course there was natural gas under Port Huron, and that there was also oil, as was known since the great oil boom of the 1860s. And still, the Weekly Daily Times was pointing out that Port Huron's prosperity did not depend upon the gas and oil and the rock underlying it, and that those who spent money in seeking to develop either would not be likely to see it again. The Times' prophetic words became a reality only too soon. Within a few years, a true state of the inexhaustible supply of the Great Reserve beneath the city of Port Huron was apparent. It was eventually found out that there was not a sufficiency of gas in any of the wells drilled to adequately supply the city. Of the 75 wells drilled, only one-third gave gas. By October of 1889, the St. Clair Light and Fuel Company was considered bankrupt. Eventually, this bankrupt company was purchased by the Port Huron Fuel Gas and Light Company. This was a company that was going back to making artificial gas, and they'd be in direct competition with the Port Huron Gas Light Company, which was the first artificial gas company in Port Huron. Port Huron Fuel Gas and Light Company built a new plant uh, down on Grizzle Street, uh, near the end of Grizzle Street, uh, near 4th Street. Of course, 4th Street doesn't go all the way through now. But it would be just about uh, that area you see on the left across from the new YMCA. This would be looking west up Grizzle Street. Eventually the two gas companies would merge into the Port Huron Gas Company. Join me in our next video and we'll look at something else besides utilities.